Star Wars is one of the biggest media franchises in the world right now, and it has been for quite a while. We're slowly but surely closing in on 50 years since the saga of this incredible universe began, and Star Wars has yet to really lose momentum. It's still a cultural juggernaut, and it means a lot to many people. Its universe is endlessly fascinating, its vast array of media has something for everyone to enjoy, and its stories resonate strongly with us. Star Wars has power to it, something that's been clear ever since A New Hope shattered records back in 1977. Even though its stories play out in a time and place far removed from everything we've ever known, they carry deep meaning that has dramatically affected many people. Because the meaning and themes of Star Wars, unlike the setting, the characters and so on, are anything but alien. And the deeper meanings we connect with are why Star Wars has had such an impact on so many people. Star Wars is important, and in this video, we'll be explaining why. Attention, Sergeant on deck! We're going to start with the prologue from the Revenge of the Sith novelization, which gets part of our point across better than we could. This story happened a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. It is already over. Nothing can be done to change it. It is a story of love and loss, brotherhood and betrayal, courage and sacrifice, and the death of dreams. It is a story of the blurred line between our best and our worst. It is the story of the end of an age. But there's a strange thing about stories. Though all this happened so long ago and so far away that words cannot describe the time or the distance, it is also happening right now, right here. It is happening as you read these words. This is how 25 millennia come to a close. Corruption and treachery have crushed a thousand years of peace. This is not just the end of a republic. Night is falling on civilization itself. This is the twilight of the Jedi. And the end starts now. Star Wars is not about the people of a distant galaxy. It's not about Skywalkers or the Force or the rebellion against the Empire. It's about us, here and now, and the struggles we've faced for as long as we've been writing things down. It dresses everything up in the setting of an enthralling, fantastical, distant galaxy full of history and lore, but all of this is a smokescreen used to shroud very down-to-earth themes and topics. Not that we don't love or respect the smokescreen in its own right, just scroll through our video backlog if you doubt us on that one. But what infuses Star Wars with meaning, what makes all those fantastical elements all the more compelling, are its deeply human themes. Those themes resonate with us. They're relevant to our lives and to the conditions of our world. In contrast to sci-fi universes like Star Trek, which imagines what could or should be, Star Wars is firmly about what is, preserving all the little irrationalities that define our societies. But Star Wars isn't just contemporary. Its themes are timeless, and they've been part of us since the dawn of human civilization. Star Wars addresses the core problems and questions that we find ourselves coming back to time and time again. Star Wars, in large part, is a hero's journey story, as we'll discuss in depth later. It's also about deep philosophical concepts, the true nature of right and wrong, and the civilizational questions and struggles that arise time and time again, the constant cycle of republics, empires, and revolutions. As we'll discuss, it deals with many modern societal problems very directly, treating them as part of a pattern that has defined much of human history. And it deals with all these hard themes and questions from behind the curtain of science fiction, making them more fun and more comfortable to consider. Like many of the best speculative fiction stories, Star Wars strikes a balance between allowing you to detach from reality and giving you real-world themes to contemplate. It not only deals with some of humanity's core struggles, but it presents them in a fun and digestible way that makes them easier to understand. But today, we're going to be peeling back the smokescreen and taking a look at those themes head on. 
so as to discern what precisely makes Star Wars so important to us. In this video, we're exclusively going to be addressing the six original saga films. They will be pulling quotes from their novelizations here and there as well. These themes and messages pervade most Star Wars media, however. They are, after all, the core of its universe. In particular, we're going to be discussing the themes of three aspects of the Star Wars saga. The Force, the travails of galactic civilization, and the tale of the Skywalkers. We're going to start with the framing each of the films begins with, the struggle between liberty and tyranny in the galaxy. The opening crawl of A New Hope introduces the Star Wars galaxy as a place embroiled in civil war, where a ruthless tyrannical empire is being challenged by a small band of heroic rebels. This conflict, the Galactic Civil War, is the main overarching plot of the original trilogy. The main plot of the prequel trilogy, on the other hand, is about the decay of an ancient republic and the destruction of democracy bringing the Empire into being. The societal story that Star Wars tells comes in three parts. The fall of democracy, the rise of empire, and the start of revolution. We're going to address each part individually, and to provide a general framework to begin, we're going to quote an interview George Lucas gave in 2005. In the interest of not getting whacked by YouTube, we're going to avoid including outright clips from this and the other Lucas interviews we're going to be citing, but links to each of them will be included in the description. I wanted to figure out how democracies give themselves over to tyrants. There's an interesting thing about democracy, which is that if you don't treat it well, if you don't do your job, especially if you're a representative in the Senate or the Parliament or whatever, then the whole thing can go awry. Because if you're always bickering and not agreeing on things and doing the people's work, who elected you, a tyrant will come in, take over, and do it for you, because the people want to get the job done. The introduction to the 1976 novelization of A New Hope, ghostwritten by Alan Dean Foster based on George Lucas's instructions, puts it another way. Once, under the wise rule of the Senate and the protection of the Jedi Knights, the Republic thrived and grew. But, as often happens when wealth and power pass beyond the admirable and attain the awesome, there appear those evil ones with greed to match. So it was with the Republic at its height. Like the greatest of trees able to withstand any external attack, the Republic rotted from within, though the danger was not visible from outside. That leads us to the chronological beginning of Star Wars story, the prequel trilogy. Even before the first of the films hit theaters, Star Wars story always began with the Galactic Republic. The passage we just quoted was from the beginning of the very first piece of Star Wars media, the novelization of A New Hope, which started with a brief recounting of how the Republic had become the Empire. You would be surprised by just how closely the prequels adhered to the summary Lucas provided here. The prologue goes on to discuss how Senator Palpatine made himself emperor with the help of corrupt politicians and powerful corporate interests, and it even mentions that the Jedi Knights were wiped out through treachery and deception. Nonetheless, there were changes made to the Republic's history between 1976 and the writing of the prequel trilogy, one of which you might already be laughing at. Anyone who's seen any prequel era material should immediately know what's wrong with the phrase, wise rule of the Senate. The Senate, much like the Republic itself, is being romanticized here, and wildly so. If the Senate was ever wise or even functional, we've yet to see it in any Star Wars story, never mind the films. But relative to the Empire and the political situation that develops over the source of the saga, the time of the Old Republic was indeed a better one. It was never ideal, far from it. We've certainly discussed the evils of the Republic in depth many times before, but the Republic had one element that, Star Wars contends, is vital to any healthy society. Democracy. The idea of democracy is pervasive in Star Wars. One trilogy is about how it falls, and the other is about trying to restore it. Democracy is held up as an essential condition of a just society, the only legitimate way for any government to work, and the Republic, theoretically, represents a galactic-scale democratic government. But democracy itself is actually pretty scarce in the films. There are characters like Padme Amidala, who champion democracy and embody its values, but even in The Phantom Menace, 
the Republic is well on its way to ceasing to be a democracy, and democracy is defined in Star Wars primarily by its absence and the problems caused by that absence. Now, defining what makes a real democracy is somewhat tricky, and Star Wars allows for a multitude of definitions, but it also disregards some of the more common ones. Many people would tell you that a system is democratic if it's electoral, but in Star Wars, the Empire still has an elected Senate until A New Hope, and it's still made clear to have never been a democracy. In a broad sense, Star Wars characterizes democracy in a very practical manner. Democracy in Star Wars is when the interests of the government are representative of the interests of the people, not those of powerful individuals or groups. That alone is a pretty profound message, especially in how it conflicts with the state of systems we often take for granted as being democratic. But The Phantom Menace shows us that this is something that has mostly ceased to exist in the Republic. As that novel passage said, when wealth and power pass beyond the admirable and attain the awesome, there appear those evil ones with greed to match. And in The Phantom Menace, those evil ones are represented by the Trade Federation, who are motivated nigh exclusively by greed. Everything the Trade Federation does in The Phantom Menace is meant to show just how far the Republic has already fallen from its ideals. They have a private army, they go to war with innocent planets to protest government policy they don't like, and they even have representation in the Senate. That last point is a not-so-subtle way of showing the intended subtext here. The Republic has come to represent the interests of the Trade Federation as much as, if not more than, the people. Attack of the Clones shows us that the Trade Federation isn't the only corporation with such power either. These factions have so much control that the Republic doesn't even respond to their abuses. The Trade Federation starts a local war within Republic space, and the Senate is too busy debating whether the war in their territory is even real to do anything about it. But it's not just the corporations that are responsible for the Republic's decay. Apart from Palpatine himself, the films don't give us any specific shifty politician characters, except for Lot Dodd, but he's literally Senator for the Trade Federation. But they make clear that most of the Senate is corrupt, and that this corruption is the source of endless gridlock in both the Senate and the courts. Those who don't represent corporate interests outright either do so covertly, or primarily represent their own personal interests. The actual people of the galaxy had no real representation in the Senate, apart from the likes of Padme Amidala. The rest played out as Lucas summarized in the earlier quote. The lack of genuine representation left the door open to a power-hungry dictator who exploited the disaffection of the people to dismantle what democracy the Republic had left, indulging its worst aspects. That power-hungry dictator, of course, was Palpatine in the films. But Palpatine himself was an allegory, an archetype that has appeared far too often in history. Lucas based Palpatine rather explicitly on Richard Nixon, for reasons we'll get to shortly. But he has also said that Palpatine draws on the history of figures like Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, and all tyrants who exploit broken systems to amass enormous power at the expense of the people. To do so, Palpatine, like a great many leaders before him, manufactured a war to skew public opinion. While we're not aware of any real-world conflicts that were as carefully manufactured and 4 d chessed as the Clone Wars, we can think of plenty of wars that were started by power-hungry leaders for their own benefit, and we're sure you can too. In the films, the Clone Wars are complex and engineered for a variety of objectives, but one of the big ones is to scare people into finishing off the Republic for good, into giving away what democracy they have left. The prequel trilogy chronicles Palpatine's rise from being senator to being emperor, but the way it does so is interesting. A lot of the time, Palpatine doesn't actually seize power. He's given it. He's manipulating events behind the scenes, of course, but the plot hinges on other people being disaffected enough to be manipulated by him, to the point where they're willing to hand him power. Padme gives him the supreme chancellery. Jar Jar gives him emergency powers, which the Senate as a whole adds to until they've given him everything. And when all is said and done, when the last vestiges of democracy are destroyed, the Senate breaks out in thunderous applause. The message of the prequel trilogy is that, to again quote George Lucas, democracies aren't overthrown, they're given away. The Republic's corruption causes it to cease to be truly democratic, but few people recognize this fact, 
and instead, they associate democracy with the failings of the Senate. Then, when a crisis begins and the corrupt Senate is unable to react, they become willing to throw away democracy, to throw away their freedoms and civil liberties in exchange for a strong authority figure who promises to make everything right. It's not hard to see the parallels all throughout history. Writing the prequels in the early 2000s, Lucas was thinking of the war on terror and the massive erosion of civil liberties playing out at that time. But history presents countless other examples of the same phenomenon which we never seem to learn from. Star Wars understands the value of democracy and understands how democracy is lost. It understands that cooperative and pluralistic democracy can seem less appealing than a stronger, unilateral, powerful state that promises security and prosperity. But it desperately tries to get us to see that it's not. It tries to teach us not to let old mistakes be repeated, but it also understands that we invariably will, and that we will do so without really understanding that we're doing it. The prequel trilogy shows us how this process works. The original trilogy shows us what it inevitably leads to. It's all too easy to place the blame for dictatorships on the shoulders of individual tyrants, but the truth that Star Wars forces us to confront is that tyranny is a group effort. Palpatine was more of a symptom than the problem itself. The Republic was already corrupt and had already destroyed what democracy it had. Palpatine simply hastened the end of the process and filled the resultant power vacuum. The introduction to the A New Hope novelization shows this even more clearly. Once secure in office, he declared himself emperor, shutting himself away from the populace. Soon he was controlled by the very assistants and bootlickers he had appointed to high office, and the cries of the people for justice did not reach his ears. The imperial governors and bureaucrats prepared to institute a reign of terror among the disheartened worlds of the galaxy. Many used the imperial forces and the name of the increasingly isolated emperor to further their own personal ambitions. In case you are wondering, this was why the emperor never appeared and was barely mentioned in A New Hope. When the film was being made, the understanding was that the real rulers of the empire were the men in that conference room on the Death Star, the warlords and industrialists who profited from the empire's violence. This obviously changed once the emperor became the Dark Lord of the Sith for the Empire Strikes Back, but there are traces of this understanding of tyranny all through the saga. Star Wars does away with facile concepts of tyranny being the work of evil individuals and understands that any form of tyranny is supported and often even controlled by all manner of powerful interests. In some recent sources like Andor, we see this dynamic more explicitly. In those sources, the evil of the Empire is shown to not mainly be because of the Emperor or the Senate, but because of the tyrannical apparatus as a whole, which enables the already powerful to wield state power against those they see as beneath them. Tyranny serves and is served in turn by the groups that democracy is meant to keep in check. In the 19-year gap between the original and prequel trilogies, the Empire transforms the galaxy. The Senate continues to exist up until A New Hope, but by this point, it has long since ceased to be a democratic institution in fact, if not in name, not only due to the dictatorial authority of the Emperor, but also the incredible power wielded by the Imperial military and the governors it has installed in every sector of the galaxy. Slight vestiges of democracy are preserved, perhaps in a half-hearted attempt to convince the people that the Empire represents them, but the Empire is firmly an oligarchy nonetheless, and a brutal, repressive one. The tyranny of the Empire, like the democracy of the Republic, isn't actually shown much on screen. Instead, it's characterized by the trends established in the prequels and a few scenes on Tatooine and Bespin. The prequels focus on the erosion of liberty in the name of security as the foundation of the Empire, and the original trilogy shows how this sort of security really just amounts to pushing innocent people around. On Tatooine, the Empire has spies all over Mos Eisley, and stormtrooper patrols are allowed to murder civilians with impunity. On Bespin, the Empire implements martial law and allows bounty hunters free reign on Cloud City. The security that tyranny promises is shown to be selective. It's security for the power of the Empire, and everyone else be damned. The same is true of all the other promises of the Empire, 
the prosperity, the strength, and the power. Palpatine promised all those things to the people of the galaxy. In the Revenge of the Sith novelization, his slogan for the Empire is safety, security, justice, and peace. But the original trilogy shows us that the Empire only really cares about providing all that to the people with power, and that it does so by taking those things away from everyone else. The ordinary people on Tatooine are less safe when stormtroopers can kill them with impunity. The ordinary people on Cloud City are less secure when they're under martial law. There is no justice in the Empire, and in this period of civil war, the sure as hell isn't peace either. Star Wars makes abundantly clear that every last promise of Empire is a lie. In sharp contrast to the Senate-heavy prequel trilogy, the original trilogy shows very little of the Imperial government. Apart from the Emperor himself, there's a mention of the Imperial Senate in A New Hope, if only to establish that it's been dissolved, and there's a handful of Imperial officials who get a few seconds of background screen time in Return of the Jedi, but that's about it. Most of the time, all you see of the Empire is its military, because that's all the Empire really is. Far from being a strong, secure state, it's just a massive military, with the requisite support structures and a few token vestiges of civilian government, and the Imperial military serves no one but itself. This, Star Wars tells us, is the true face of tyranny, the militarization of everything, all for the benefit of a dictator and his buddies. Again, this isn't all that new of a concept. George Lucas has said many times that the Empire is meant to represent the essence of all historical empires, with the Roman Empire, Nazi Germany, and the British Empire all being noteworthy influences. What's less obvious is that Star Wars is also equating empires as a concept with tyranny. Sure, the Empire does stuff that all but the edgiest of edgelords would consider tyrannical, but what makes the Empire fundamentally tyrannical is the simple fact that it is an empire. Think back to the declaration of a new order from Revenge of the Sith and Padme's famous line about the death of liberty. She wasn't talking specifically about Palpatine declaring himself emperor. He never actually does so on screen in the film version. She's talking about the declaration that the Republic will be reformed into the Galactic Empire. And even before knowing that this means dictatorship, before knowing exactly the shape the Empire will take, Padme already knows that tyranny has taken hold of the galaxy. In the gap between the two trilogies, the Empire wages endless wars, both against external powers and against internal dissent. Opposition to the Empire from within is brutally crushed, and the Empire is constantly expanding, devouring more and more systems to exploit. Star Wars makes clear that this is the essence of a tyrannical state, this sort of repression and expansionism. Perhaps more interestingly, Star Wars asserts that an empire is the polar opposite of a democracy, crushing all opposing voices and forcing the will of a central state on unwilling vassals is, after all, antithetical to rule by and for the people. Most boldly of all, Star Wars establishes in no uncertain terms that there's only one solution to empires, only one way for the people to be rid of tyranny, revolution. Just as the plot of the prequel trilogy was about the fall of democracy, the plot of the original trilogy was about its restoration, through violent revolution against the Empire. Granted, the rebellion as shown in the films is rather tame, all things considered. Their grittier side is left to stories like Andor. But even the sanitized revolution shown in the original trilogy is a bold statement. The heroes are still killing soldiers and blowing up ships and space stations, waging a full-on war against the government. They're framed in the narrative as classic speculative fiction underdogs, but the alliance to restore the Republic is nonetheless an insurgent force. In an interview with George Lucas for a series about the history of science fiction, fellow sci-fi director James Cameron characterized the heroes of the original trilogy in the following way. The good guys are the rebels. They're using asymmetric warfare against a highly organized empire. I think we'd call those guys terrorists today. To which George Lucas simply responded, when I did it, they were Viet Cong. Star Wars doesn't just take cues from history. It was commentary on the modern day too. And the original trilogy wasn't about World War II, though it certainly takes a lot of stylistic cues from it. It was about the Vietnam War. A New Hope actually evolved from the same concept as the Vietnam War movie, Apocalypse Now, which George Lucas was originally supposed to direct. 
Star Wars ended up being a much different project that took a dramatically different turn, but when Lucas started work on the script for it in 1973, while the war was ongoing, Vietnam was at the top of his mind, and its influence is pervasive all throughout the original trilogy. It would be a stretch to say that the alliance to restore the Republic is a complete analogue for the Viet Cong, though the Empire and the Republic is meant to be a complete analogue for, or really a warning to, the late Cold War United States, particularly under Richard Nixon's so-called Imperial Presidency. For the most part, the Rebels are just another set of space Americans, taking after the American Revolution against the British Empire more than the Vietnam War. But influences from Vietnam shine through all the same. After all, the Empire's ultimate defeat comes on a forest planet, where the highly advanced Imperial military is crushed by indigenous people's courage, superior knowledge of the land, and basic traps. Just as George Lucas considers all empires to be recurrences of the same general concept, he sees common trends in all rebellions, and the Rebel Alliance is again a representation of all of them. And just as the Empire is depicted as the antithesis to democracy, the Rebellion is depicted as its embodiment, which is a pretty bold statement. Far from the mindless chaos that Rebellions are often depicted as, Star Wars casts Rebellion as a noble act that is the only way to restore a lost democracy, as Rebellion is, of course, the will of a disenfranchised people making itself known. Since the release of A New Hope, the notion of a noble, underdog rebellion against a powerful, evil empire has become ubiquitous, and it hardly seems novel or bold to us nearly 50 years later. But the original trilogy carries messages that are still subversive today. It teaches that it's right to fight back against evil, even if, especially if, that evil is a legitimate authority. It teaches that rebellion in itself is not chaos, but justice, and it encourages us to introspect to consider whether we ourselves have become the Empire, and if so, what we can do to jump ship to the Rebellion. That last point is emphasized a bit more strongly in a cut plot from A New Hope, in which Luke's childhood best friend Biggs Darklighter joins the Imperial Academy at the start of the film, and ends up flying an X-Wing in the Battle of Yavin at the end. Apart from the basic good-evil dichotomy and all that entails, which we'll get to soon, there are two other major ways Star Wars distinguishes the Rebellion from the Empire. The Rebels are shown, generally speaking, to be more spirited than their Imperial counterparts, to be more invested in the fight and to care more about each other. The Imperials, like the Empire itself, care only about themselves and not about the broader cause. After all, there is no broader cause beyond increasing the power of those at the top. The Rebels, on the other hand, are strongly devoted to freedom, democracy, and the well-being of the people, and this gives them courage and heroism that allows them to outmaneuver and even defeat the Empire on the battlefield. The other notable distinction between the Rebellion and the Empire is one that comes from history, technological and numerical disparity. The Empire has newer and theoretically better technology than the Rebellion, and it has far more of it, plus more people to use it. The Rebellion is outnumbered and outgunned, and the Empire typically relies on those strengths to win the day, employing overwhelming force and powerful military equipment that the Rebellion has no equivalent for. Imperial Walkers, Superstar Destroyers, and the Death Stars. And one of the most fascinating messages of Star Wars, one that can be easy to miss, is that this doesn't matter. To again quote George Lucas talking about the American Revolution, We were fighting the largest empire in the world, and we were just a bunch of hayseeds in coonskin hats who don't know nothing. And it was the same thing with the Vietnamese. But the irony of that one is that in both of those, the little guy won. And the big, highly technical empire, the British Empire, the American Empire, lost. In the original trilogy, Darth Vader himself explains why. Because no technological terror is a match for the power of the Force. Obviously, the Force isn't something that exists in the real world, but what it represents, the interconnection and interdependency of all life, and the strength and courage that can be drawn from it, does. And so, it's the first difference between the Rebellion and the Empire, not the second, that matters. Throughout the original trilogy, this disdain for relying on superior technology is everywhere. The Death Star being destroyed by a tiny starfighter is the most obvious one, but there's more to that than meets the eye. Because the Death Star wasn't destroyed by inferior technology, but by the Force, and human intuition, allowing Luke Skywalker to do what a targeting computer 
was incapable of. The same phenomenon happens on Endor, where stormtroopers and ATSTs are eviscerated by Ewoks with Stone Age traps and weapons. Only one of these was an explicit case of the Force coming into play, but it was what made the difference either way. Whether overtly or otherwise, the Rebel Alliance won because the Force was with them. And with that, we leave the broader societal issues of Star Wars behind. It's now time to discuss another major aspect of the Star Wars saga, the Force. The Force is a dual role in Star Wars. On the one hand, it's the universe's magic system, the explanation for all the cool things our heroes do, and a way to separate the characters who can perform such incredible feats from the ordinary people. But the Force is also a philosophical concept, and the philosophy behind it is one of the most important lessons Star Wars has to teach. In the philosophical sense, as we said in the last section, the Force is representative of the interconnection of life in general and humanity in particular. The very concept of the Force is a lesson in itself, so we're going to start there by discussing the nature of the Force. We've done that a billion times before on this channel, but we promise that this isn't going to be a rehash, so don't click away just yet. The Force is present all throughout the Star Wars saga, but the best explanation of what the Force itself is, in our opinion, comes from Yoda in The Empire Strikes Back. For my ally is the Force, and the powerful ally it is. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. The Force is life, an integral aspect of the universe that is created and strengthened by the creation and strengthening of life. Life itself has power, not just by action, but simply by existing. That power is everywhere. It surrounds us, as Yoda says. And while the Force is created by and intimately tied to life, it is not exclusive to it. Life of any sort, no matter how small, leaves its mark wherever it touches, and so the Force is ubiquitous, present even in the hearts of stars and the vacuum of space. Non-living inanimate objects, places, and planets can be strong in the Force through the power of life, and even those that aren't are touched by the Force, shaped by the power of life. And to an extent, this is true in the real world as well. Life has transformed the Earth and been transformed by it in turn. Atmospheric oxygen, the air we breathe, is actually unstable without the presence of life. The very atmosphere, one of the most important parts of our planet, which itself was originally the creation of photosynthetic microbes, is constantly shaped and refreshed by life much as the Force is. One of the more controversial aspects of the prequels was the introduction of midichlorians to this dichotomy, symbiotic microbes that were the source of sentience ability to channel the Force. It's often said that this demystifies the Force and we tend to agree, but while the Force was probably more interesting before the introduction of midichlorians, there's something valuable in the idea. It's a reminder that the Force is not just the incredible feats of power Jedi and Sith perform, not just the domain of macroscopic organisms, but something that belongs to all life, even the smallest varieties. And midichlorians are also a reminder that the Force is not a form of individual power, it's connective, symbiotic even. Because as Yoda states, the Force doesn't just surround all living things, it binds them as well. Through the Force, all life is bound intimately to each other, all symbiotic and interconnected, and this connection extends to everything the Force touches, non-living matter included. All things are one in the Force. This connection is explained to be the source of all the crazy magic the Jedi and Sith are able to pull off over the course of the Star Wars saga. It's by drawing on connections in the Force in certain ways that all these amazing things can be accomplished. You must feel the Force around you. Here, between you, me. The tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes, even between the land and the ship. There is no force binding all things in the real world, but there is still connection everywhere, imperceptible, and through the force, Star Wars teaches us to acknowledge and respect it. Nothing ever truly stands alone. All things are affected by each other, life especially, and there's power and wisdom in recognizing that. Just as Star Wars paints Han Solo as foolish for his disbelief in the Force, it teaches us that it's foolish to deny the interdependency we have with everything and everyone around us. 
The interconnection that the Force provides and its intimate relationship with all life leads us to what perhaps is the most important lesson that Yoda has for us. Luminous being Zoe, not this crude matter. The existence of the Force and the connection it brings means that life is significant for its own sake, far beyond the sum of its parts. That we live and do so, connected to the world around us, makes us luminous beings, priceless and worthwhile regardless of who or what we are. We may seem insignificant in comparison to the stars, but in the Force, we burn just as brightly. The lesson of this is simple. We all matter, not because of what we do or what we can do, but simply because we are alive, and that makes a difference for everything and everyone around us. And while Star Wars frames this through the lens of the Force, it makes clear that this is not only because of the Force. Non-Force sensitives draw on this in other ways all throughout the Star Wars saga. Our heroes, even those who aren't Jedi, always achieve victory through cooperation and faith in each other, from the Battle of Naboo to the Battle of Endor. This is even a message that ties back to the societal aspects of Star Wars, because the power and value of democracy is that it embraces such things, while tyranny rejects it. Whether directly or indirectly, the power of the Force is something all beings have access to, but there are many ways in which power can be used. Star Wars presents the Force as a binary, divided between good and evil. Its two aspects are usually characterized as the light and dark sides. Though as we said in an earlier video, the concept of the light side isn't really present in the original six films, and the light is really just the Force as it is meant to be. That's mostly semantics, but it makes an important difference. It means that the dark side is a perversion, and that when characters in the film speak of balance in the Force, they mean the eradication of the dark side, not balancing the dark side with the light, as the term light side somewhat implies. We're going to be using the term light side anyway in this next section, for the sake of simplicity, but please keep that distinction in mind. If you're a long-time viewer of this channel, you've probably already heard us say that the difference between the two sides of the Force was how they reacted to the will of the Force. Lightsiders embraced it and acted as instruments for the Force, while Darksiders imposed their own selfish desires upon the Force. All of that is accurate, and it comes from George Lucas' conception of the Force, but it's not something the films really elaborate on. The fact that the Force has a conscious will is a necessary implication, but not even that is really stated. More to the point, this isn't a video about the Force, it's about what Star Wars is trying to teach us with it. The will of the Force doesn't exist in real life, but the questions it provokes and the dynamics of the light and dark sides do. Let's consider the light side first. As the light side is just the default state of the Force, we've really already covered the basics of how it works. It was about drawing on the interconnection of life. Star Wars associates this with a variety of characteristics, some of which help Jedi to channel the light, and some of which are a consequence of doing so. By and large, these characteristics are how Star Wars defines heroism and virtue. The Jedi, in particular, are meant to be embodiments of goodness, even if they're all undeniably flawed and make mistakes, especially in the prequels. We can learn a lot from what the films show us of their teachings. First and foremost, Patience is something that Jedi really focus on in the films. Obi-Wan, Yoda, and Qui-Gon all preach it to their apprentices, and in the original trilogy especially, the greatness of the Jedi is usually conveyed by their patience and the calm they draw from it, even in tricky situations. Jedi love to meditate to gather their strength when crisis hits, and even in the midst of pitched battles, they're usually shown to be patient enough to stay level-headed instead of giving in to anger, hate, or other negative emotions. In the prequels, a lot of emphasis is placed on the Jedi's attitude towards emotion, love especially, and as we've discussed many times, the lesson Star Wars is trying to teach there is usually misunderstood. Jedi do not believe themselves to be without emotion, or that they should strive to be. Rather, they simply try to avoid strong passions, and they especially try to avoid letting their emotions get the better of them. Rather than letting their emotions rule their actions, the Jedi strive to keep themselves in balance, to maintain that patience and calm that makes them so awe-inspiring. One part of this is self-reflection and self-criticism, which are put on display as Jedi virtues and signs of wisdom throughout the films, the prequels especially. Good Jedi are honest with themselves, willing to recognize their failures and do their best to make amends. Unlike the antagonists of Star Wars who do not abide failure, 
Jedi recognize their mistakes and forgive others and themselves. Darth Vader kills his subordinates for failing him, and his whole reason for being evil stems from an inability to make amends or forgive himself. But the Jedi do not hold grudges. They understand that mistakes happen, and most importantly, they're willing to own up to them and show grace and forgiveness to others who fail them. I've disappointed you. I haven't been very appreciative of your training. I've been arrogant, and I apologize. I've just been so frustrated with the Council. You are strong and wise, Anakin, and I am very proud of you. I have trained you since you were a small boy. I have taught you everything I know, and you have become a far greater Jedi than I could ever hope to be. Nonetheless, the Jedi way, the way of the light, is shown to be demanding and difficult, requiring discipline and self-control to maintain. As is often the case, the easier path is generally the wrong one in the Star Wars universe, and it takes constant effort, constant reflection, and constant self-correction to maintain Jedi discipline. A controversial part of this is that Jedi strive to avoid strong attachments, especially romantic ones, which might incline them to act rashly in a moment of crisis. This is often misconstrued as a general ban on love, but Attack of the Clones tells us otherwise. Attachment is forbidden. Possession is forbidden. Compassion, which I would define as unconditional love, is central to a Jedi's life. And so you might say that we are encouraged to love. The distinction here is between what the Jedi perceive as selfish and selfless forms of love. The Jedi see attachment as leading to possession, which is inherently selfish. We shouldn't need to tell you that a possessive relationship or any form of relationship that leads to seeing another person as yours is toxic. The Jedi don't believe that all romantic love inherently ends up this way, but they see it as too much of a risk for beings that have the weight of the galaxy on their shoulders. The story of Anakin Skywalker's relationship with Padme and where it leads Anakin pretty much embodies what the Jedi are wary of here. Now most of us don't have the weight of the galaxy on our shoulders, and so attachment and romantic relationships being bad isn't the lesson we're supposed to take away from this. The lesson meant for us is that love should be selfless, and that possessive relationships aren't really about love. Beyond that, however, it's important to note what the Jedi don't forbid here. Compassion or as Anakin puts it, unconditional love. Rather, compassion and the related positive emotions are central to a Jedi's life, and central to virtuous use of the Force. These things nurture life, and as a result, they nurture the Force, strengthening all beings in the process. Moreover, the Jedi emphasize these virtues because they're a requirement for the core teaching of the Jedi, self-sacrifice. If you were to sum up the light side, the way of the Jedi, in a single word, it should be selflessness, being willing to sacrifice for the benefit of others. This ties back to the whole will of the force definition, but the simpler way it's presented in the films makes the lesson a bit more clear. The heart of virtue, Star Wars teaches, is selflessness and compassion, caring about others and being able to put them ahead of yourself. In the extreme, it means being willing to sacrifice your own life to save others, something Obi-Wan Kenobi demonstrated all the way back in A New Hope. This leads us to another controversial bit of Jedi teaching introduced in the prequels. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not, miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy. The shadow of greed, that is. A lot of people blame Yoda for Anakin's fall to the dark side, given what he says here. But those that do are missing something important, which is that Yoda is right, and that what he's saying is exactly what Anakin needed to be told in this moment, even if he ultimately failed to heed this advice. At this point in the story, Anakin is already well on the path to the dark side, something proved by his line before this, which is that he won't let his visions of Padme's death come to pass, no matter what. As we pointed out before, Anakin wanted to save Padme for his sake, not hers. She understood Yoda's message here, 
and really wasn't all that concerned about the possibility of dying. Anakin's relationship with Padme had become possessive, and as Yoda gently pointed out, the shadow of greed, that is. What's more, as Yoda said, death is a natural part of life, and trying to stop it altogether is futile. Yoda himself knows this full well. At nearly 900 years old, he has seen everyone he has ever cared about die time and time again, losing another wave of people with each passing generation. Yoda's advice here, to let go, is exactly what Anakin needed to do. It was the only thing he could do. Anakin wasn't willing to hear it, but the rest of us can be. Death is hard, but it's inevitable, and when it comes, it's important, if extremely difficult, to try to let go. What Yoda's saying in a very gentle way is that much of the time, we cling to the dying or deceased for our sake, not theirs, and in doing so, we can destroy ourselves. We need to be able to let go to heal and to let the dead rest in peace. The Jedi take this same approach to their own deaths. They are able to be as selfless as they are because they are willing to accept death when it comes for them. And in Star Wars, this willingness to die is what allows Jedi to live on as Force ghosts. The Sith, who crave eternal life, are unable to have it, because to do so means letting go. Their attachment to that goal is what prevents them from achieving it. That is the true power of the Jedi. They can let go of themselves, and in doing so, they achieve the collective power that comes from selflessness and compassion. But the Jedi, as we all know, don't have a monopoly on the Force. The main antagonists of Star Wars are those who abuse their interconnection with all life for evil, the adherents of the dark side, specifically the Sith. While the light side isn't mentioned at all times in the films, the dark side is mentioned all the time. Often, it's simply as a stand-in for evil or to characterize evil. Time and time again, characters like Yoda will describe something or other as the path to the dark side. Generally, the dark side is construed as simply being the antithesis of the light. Just as the light side is about selflessness, the dark side is about selfishness. Put in our usual way, it's bending the force to your will, prioritizing your desires over the needs of the universe. The dark side is fueled by negative emotions, especially greed, anger, and hatred. The Sith especially thrive on these things, and they bask in violence, misery, and the fear of others. Star Wars reinforces often that the path to the dark side starts small, before escalating into pure evil. In a sense, it's addictive. It offers easy solutions, but temporary ones, tempting the user to indulge in it until it consumes them. Consider Anakin's struggle in Revenge of the Sith. He wanted the power to save the ones he loved, and he drew on the dark side to do so, not only in choosing to join the Sith, but long before. Even during his talk with Yoda, he stated outright that he would do anything to stop Padme from dying. As we mentioned earlier, that was a fruitless venture, and the way of the light side was to recognize that and let go. But the dark side promised the power to save Padme. And in an individual case, use of the dark side could have saved Padme's life, but Padme would still eventually die. There was no saving her forever. Anakin would have to draw on the dark side again, and again, indefinitely. This is a slippery slope, as we've discussed many times before. Repeated use of the dark side as an easy way out allows selfishness to grow in the user, and before long, that selfishness will consume all else. In the case of Anakin, the further down the path of the dark side he went, the more selfish he became, the more he lost. He destroyed his relationships with everyone he cared about, and that's where the Sith come in. Their teachings urge those already on the path of the dark side to keep going, justifying the selfishness as power and all else as weakness. Acceptance of this ideology turns people into monsters. They start to see everything as competition and hierarchy, a constant battle to prove who's the strongest and they stop caring about anyone else. All that matters to them is their power. This path is self-destructive, not only to one's relationship, but to oneself. Palpatine's adherence to the dark side does a number on his physical appearance. Even before his redirected force lightning melts his face off, he ages pretty noticeably across the prequel trilogy, looking a fair bit older than you'd expect for someone in their 50s. But Palpatine and his fellow Sith would preach that this and all the rest is a worthwhile sacrifice for what the dark side has to offer. 
power, unlimited and uncontested. To the Sith, the dark side is power, the only true form of power in fact. But there's one particular moment in The Phantom Menace where the true nature of the dark side, of their selfishness and power hunger, is made very clear. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. The Jedi are defined by compassion, and the Sith are defined by compassion's inverse. Fear. Because that's what selfishness is. Not power, or pragmatism, nor any of the other masks it hides behind, but raw, animalistic terror. To again quote George Lucas, what happens when you go over to the dark side is the force gets out of balance and you become really selfish and you forget about everybody. Because when you get selfish, you get stuff or you want stuff. And when you want stuff and you get stuff, then you become afraid that somebody's going to take it away from you, whether it's a person or a thing or a particular pleasure. Once you become afraid that somebody's going to take it away from you or that you're going to lose it, then you start to become angry. Fear of loss is not only the path to the dark side, but the core of the dark side. It's that fear that leads to anger and thence to hate, which itself is just the fearful lashing out at those they're afraid of. All of this is a vicious cycle that inflicts suffering on the Darksider, which they spread to everyone around them. The Sith call the Jedi cowards for refusing to call on the dark side, but in reality, it is they who are cowards, and bravery is embodied in compassion, in not being afraid to sacrifice for others. Compare these two brief clips from Revenge of the Sith and a new hope. When faced with death, Darth Sidious, the self-proclaimed all-powerful Dark Lord of the Sith, panics and scampers into a corner, cowering from Mace Windu, while Obi-Wan Kenobi faces death with a smile on his face willingly sacrificing himself to Darth Vader. Which of these men is the coward, we ask? We think the answer is pretty clear. All this is one of Star Wars most valuable lessons. It teaches us to see through selfishness to the fear that lies within, and it teaches us to reject the lies of the dark side and be brave enough to act with compassion. It acknowledges that doing so is hard, that giving in to fear and greed are much easier than self-sacrifice, but it teaches us that it's not only the right thing to do, but the better thing to do, both for your own sake and that of everyone else. Moreover, Star Wars teaches that there's a power in the bravery of compassion and connection that the selfish can never achieve. For all the Sith tout their power, they lose in the end, and it's compassion that defeats them. The dark is powerful, but even a little bit of the light is enough to drive it away. The power of unity and collaboration far exceeds that of even the most powerful individual, and it is by embracing that that the Jedi can defeat the Sith. To quote one of our favorite parts of the Revenge of the Sith novelization, Obi-Wan doesn't even need to reach into the Force. He has already let the Force reach into him. The Force flows over him and around him as though he has stepped into a crystal pure waterfall lost in the green coils of a forgotten rainforest. When he opens himself to that sparkling stream, it flows into him and through him and out again without the slightest interference from his conscious will. The part of him that calls itself Obi-Wan Kenobi is no more than a ripple, an eddy in the pool into which he endlessly pours. There are other parts of him here as well. There is nothing here that is not a part of him, from the scuff mark on R2-D2's dome to the tattered hem of Palpatine's robe, from the spidering crack in one transparent steel panel of the curving view wall above to the great starships that still battle beyond it, because this is all part of the Force. He is both of the lightsabers that the other droid bodyguard marches forward to offer the General Grievous, and he is the General himself. He is the General's duranium ribs, he is the beating of Grievous's alien heart, and is the silent pulse of oxygen pumped through his alien veins. He is the weight of four lightsabers at the General's belt, and is the greedy anticipation the captured weapons sparked behind the General's eyes. He is even the plan for his own execution simmering within the General's brain. He is all these things, but most important, he is still Obi-Wan Kenobi. This is why he can simply stand 
why he can simply wait. He has no need to attack or to defend. There will be battle here, but he is perfectly at ease, perfectly content to let the battle start when it will start and let it end when it will end, just as he will let himself live or let himself die. This is how a great Jedi makes war. The general characteristics of the light and dark side aren't terribly unique as far as good and evil are concerned. What Star Wars brings to the table is an understanding of where these things come from and the power of making the right choice. All of the themes and messages we've discussed so far make Star Wars important, but there's one other aspect of the saga that elevates it from just being a meaningful story to being one of the most impactful stories of the past 50 years. That last aspect is the story of the saga's protagonists, Anakin and Luke Skywalker. While Star Wars is a morality tale and the story of a civilization, it's also about a family, and the journeys of its protagonists not only convey valuable lessons, but they also make a dramatic shift away from one of storytelling's most ancient patterns. We said much earlier in the video that Star Wars, in part, is a hero's journey story. For those who don't know, the hero's journey, originally known as the hero's adventure, is a story archetype that has recurred in myths from numerous cultures over the millennia, and it was most famously articulated in the 1949 book The Hero with a Thousand Faces, written by Joseph Campbell. The story of the hero's journey is retold in Star Wars as well, and not by accident, as George Lucas read this book and has cited it as a major inspiration behind the story of Luke Skywalker. In fact, when the hero's journey is mentioned nowadays, Star Wars is often the go-to example of it, even in university courses, and modern reprints of the book even have Luke Skywalker on the cover. The brief gist of the hero's journey is pretty simple. An ordinary person in the ordinary world receives a call to adventure, which promises to lead them into the world of the unknown. They initially refuse the call, but are eventually forced to accept it, generally by a force equivalent to destiny, at which point a hidden mentor with ties to the supernatural becomes known. This mentor guides the hero into the world of the unknown, typically providing them with some artifact with mystical significance. The hero crosses the threshold of the unknown, and they end up in what Campbell calls the belly of the whale, an overwhelming place or experience that severs them from the ordinary world and commits them onto the path of the hero. The hero then experiences trials that steadily shape them into who they need to be to fulfill their destiny. They encounter another supernatural figure that helps them on their quest, generally but not necessarily a goddess, but the hero then encounters temptation, which leads them into a premature encounter with a powerful adversary, traditionally a father figure. This last stage, often known as the Abyss, as it often ends in temporary defeat and is usually the hero's lowest point, is followed by or comes in tandem with some major revelation. This revelation leads to a transformation that results in the completion of the hero's quest, following which their return to the ordinary world begins. They may initially be reluctant to return, but they are often forced to, often by supernatural forces, and sometimes they must be rescued by someone from the ordinary world. Following this, they cross a return threshold, are established as a master of both the known and unknown worlds, and generally get some form of happy ending, typically involving either eternal life or something of that nature. Apart from some of the final steps, Luke Skywalker follows this framework almost exactly throughout the original trilogy. R2 and 3PO introduce him to the wider world of the Rebellion, and Obi-Wan tries to guide him towards his destiny as a Jedi. While Luke initially refuses due to obligations at home, he accepts after his home is destroyed. Obi-Wan acts as his mentor, inducts him into the world of the Force, and gives him his father's lightsaber. He and Luke then leave Tatooine behind and end up on the Death Star, the belly of the whale, where Luke leaves his old life behind and becomes entwined with the Rebellion. Throughout A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, Luke experiences trials that eventually lead him to Yoda, who's the goddess figure in this version of the narrative. While training under Yoda, Luke has a vision of his friends suffering on Bespin, the temptation that drives him into the Abyss, his confrontation with Darth Vader, in which Luke learns that Vader is his father. This revelation initially crushes Luke, but in Return of the Jedi, it gives him the incentive he needs to become a Jedi and redeem his father. 
he succeeds in becoming a Jedi and guiding the rebellion to victory. Most of the return stage of the story is skipped, but Luke does end up as a master of two worlds, so there's that. It can be argued that the sequel trilogy actually fulfills the return conditions of the hero's journey, but that's another video entirely. Now, why does Star Wars' adherence to this framework matter? Well, George Lucas built his philosophy-heavy, magic-infused Vietnam War allegory around the hero's journey for a reason. As he himself put it, his aim was to make a sort of modern mythology. Apart from the hero's journey framework, he incorporated a ton of other traditional myth elements in Star Wars. Princesses, space wizards, and above all, the overwhelming notion of destiny. But Lucas didn't just recycle old myths to give Star Wars weight, he made two very important changes to the usual formula. The more dramatic is the addition of the story of Anakin Skywalker. We've said in the past that while Luke Skywalker is the embodiment of the traditional hero, Anakin Skywalker is anything but. Anakin, after all, doesn't stay a hero. His story, or at least the part of his story in which he's the protagonist, ends with him becoming Darth Vader, embracing evil and all but destroying the galaxy's last hope. But if you pay close attention, Anakin's story has many parallels to Luke's, and it too can fit into the framework of the hero's journey. Like Luke, Anakin starts out in the ordinary world on Tatooine before being introduced to the unknown by Qui-Gon and company. Qui-Gon believes that Anakin is the chosen one and destined to be a great Jedi. And though Anakin at first struggles to accept the call, both because of life circumstances and the pain of having to leave his mother, he ends up leaving his ordinary life behind. Qui-Gon becomes his mentor and introduces Anakin to the world of the Jedi, helping him cross the threshold by leaving Tatooine. Anakin also ends up in the belly of the whale, this time represented by the Battle of Naboo, after which he becomes a Jedi and begins his trials. But while Luke's trials, which include destroying the Death Star at Yavin and fighting in the Battle of Hoth, guide him towards being a Jedi, Anakin's trials guide him towards the dark side. In Attack of the Clones, he gives in to his feelings for Padme and gives in to his anger towards the Sand People, while in Revenge of the Sith, he murders Count Dooku in cold blood. Correspondingly, Anakin's goddess figure is also twisted. Palpatine fills this role when he tells Anakin the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Anakin's moment of temptation is less a distraction from this path and more something that spurs him forwards. This scene is titled Padme's Ruminations on the Revenge of the Sith DVD. And in our opinion, it's one of the most powerful scenes in the saga. For fear of losing Padme, Anakin dives headfirst into the abyss, arriving at Palpatine's office just before Mace Windu kills him. He confronts Sidious for who he is, and he chooses to join him. His moment of revelation comes after he kills Mace Windu and is anointed Darth Vader when he realizes how far he's fallen. From there, he destroys the Jedi. He ensures the establishment of the Empire, and as Darth Vader, he plunges the galaxy into darkness. Anakin's story is a dark mirror of Luke's. He not only subverts the classical notion of the hero, but betrays it completely, becoming the very thing he swore to destroy. In a sense, Anakin is a warning against the dangers of powerful heroes. Power can be used for both good and evil, and when seen as an end in itself, as Anakin eventually begins to, power can corrupt. The original Clone Wars micro-series has a really chilling sequence, The Legend of the Ghost Hand, that encapsulates the moral of Anakin's story really well. Due to copyright, we can't include the clip here, but it's linked in the description. The story of Anakin Skywalker in the prequel trilogy is a sobering reminder that heroes aren't always who they appear to be, and that even the most noble of people can be corrupted and consumed by their own power. But this is a lesson that's present in the story of Luke Skywalker as well, if in a much more subtle way. That leads us to the other major way in which George Lucas subverts convention with Star Wars heroes, their relationship with destiny. Destiny is a prominent theme all across mythology. Myths and stories often include prophecies of some kind that relate to the hero's adventures. Often, the end goal of the hero's journey is the subject of destiny, decreed by fate, and fate is what forces them to accept the call and stay on the path. Trying to define destiny rarely ends well for heroes. Usually, an attempt to do so either ends in the hero giving up and accepting their doom, 
or in their attempt to thwart fate, they end up causing the very thing they're trying to prevent. In the latter case, the destiny or prophecy in question generally isn't a pleasant one. Though we tend to think of destiny as a positive thing, it isn't always, and many heroes have rather unpleasant destinies that they try to run from but prove unable to. Examples of this include the infamous Oedipus, the titular character of the ancient play Oedipus Rex, and Turin Turumbar from the mythos of J.R. Tolkien. Anakin Skywalker fits this mold as well, as he spends Revenge of the Sith trying to thwart his own visions of Padme's impending death, only to cause them to come true. This underscores something that can sometimes be ignored when it comes to destiny. Its existence implies a lack of free will, that our choices are predetermined to some extent, and our actions are decided before we make them. It means we have little or no real power over our lives. Indeed, this is a core message of some of the hero's journey stories that emphasize the inevitability of fate. Destiny is framed as a divine or otherwise inviolable force, and mere mortals can do nothing about it. To even try is hubris. Destiny is very prominent in Star Wars. Anakin and Luke get told that something is their destiny about as often as they're warned that something will lead to the dark side. Sometimes destiny and prophecy are positive. The Jedi's prophecy of the Chosen One, for example, is interpreted to mean that Anakin's destiny is to destroy the Sith and bring balance to the Force. But as Anakin's visions of Padme suggest, destiny in Star Wars isn't necessarily a good thing. This is especially true in the prequels, where the story of Anakin Skywalker is essentially framed according to two different interpretations of his destiny, the Jedi's and the Sith's. While the Jedi have faith in the prophecy of the Chosen One and Anakin's destiny as the savior of the galaxy, Darth Sidious believes that Anakin's destiny is to join him and destroy the Jedi. He doesn't have a specific prophecy or anything, but he foresees Anakin's fall and expresses absolute faith that Anakin will eventually join him all throughout Revenge of the Sith. Some of this can be chalked up to confidence in his own manipulations and observations of the steps Anakin has already made towards the dark side. But the completeness of Sidious' belief in Anakin's forthcoming fall, to the point where he built his entire plan around it, suggests that he believes, to some extent, that fate is on his side. The prequels end with Sidious' version of Anakin's destiny seemingly validated over that of the Jedi, and once Anakin realizes this, he firmly commits to the dark side, believing that he now can't go back. This is an important part of his fall. All throughout Revenge of the Sith, Anakin has misgivings about the path he's on, but he pushes forward because he believes he has no other choice, especially after he kills Mace Windu. He doesn't believe in redemption, and when he thinks he sees confirmation that his destiny is with the dark side, he believes there's no escaping it. The Empire Strikes Back explains where he got this belief from. The Jedi believe the same thing. If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny, consume you at will, as it did Obi-Wan's apprentice. After Mustafa, Obi-Wan and Yoda, now representing the effective last of the Jedi, believe that Anakin is forever lost. He chose the dark path, and as Yoda said, that means it has become his destiny. This isn't all that radical of a belief. In most stories, myths especially, evil is absolute, and there is no redemption possible for those consumed by it. Many people believe that to an extent, but Star Wars does not. We all know that the story of Anakin Skywalker doesn't end with Revenge of the Sith, but once he's encased in the armor of Darth Vader, he ceases to be the protagonist. And in the original trilogy, that role is instead filled by his son, Luke. And like Anakin, Luke has a destiny, something expressed most strongly in The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Yodi and Obi-Wan tell him that his destiny is to destroy Darth Vader. But that's not the whole story. The full extent of Luke's destiny is shown to us in The Empire Strikes Back.
People sometimes take this scene as foreshadowing of the revelation at the end of the film that Darth Vader is Luke's father. But that's only half of what's being said here. The point of the scene is to show the audience that Luke's destiny is to destroy Darth Vader and in doing so, become him. Vader and the Emperor are both aware of this, though Vader tries to subvert it a little by having Luke join him and destroy the Emperor instead. But regardless, this is why Vader's proclamation that the dark side is Luke's destiny rattles Luke so badly at the end of the film, because he knows from his vision in the cave that it's true. Return of the Jedi is built around whether or not Luke will fulfill this destiny. The Emperor and Vader both believe he will. The Emperor states many times that he foresees Luke's fall to the dark side, and dialogue from later in the film makes clear that he foresaw this fall happening when Luke kills Vader. Vader, for his part, seems resigned to his fate. He knows from experience, or at least he believes he does, that destiny cannot be beaten and that the Emperor's visions always come true. They did for him, after all. Even Yoda and Obi-Wan acknowledge this as Luke's destiny, and in Return of the Jedi, they seem to just be riding on the hope that Luke will at least destroy the Sith before the dark side consumes him. Nobody really seems to have any faith that Luke can successfully defy destiny. After all, nobody else in this saga has. He will kill Darth Vader, they believe, and he will fall to the dark side in the process. But we all know that's not how the story ends. Fulfill your destiny and take your father's place at my side. Never. I'll never turn to the dark side. You failed, Your Highness. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. Luke Skywalker rejects his destiny. He chooses the opposite path, to be a Jedi like his father. Darth Sidious, who has come to see his visions as absolute, his prescribed destinies as inevitable, is livid, and he tries to punish Luke for this transgression, as the forces of fate so often do in myth. But in doing so, he fails to pay attention as Anakin Skywalker follows the example of his son. In Return of the Jedi, Anakin too defies destiny. And while he couldn't save Padme from her fate, he could save Luke from his. Anakin Skywalker rejects his destiny as a Sith, and he too chooses the opposite path, to be a Jedi like his son. doing so, Anakin is technically fulfilling the prophecy of the Chosen One. But that's not the point to take away here. Both he and Luke defied what it seemed destiny intended for them. And unlike most heroes who try to do so, they were also able to prevent those destinies from coming to pass. Neither of them was forced back into fate's intended path, and both men were able to live and die as the Jedi they wanted to be, not the Sith they were destined to become. This is Star Wars' most powerful message. This is why Star Wars is important. Star Wars takes the traditional heroic myth and flips it on its head by inserting free will. It teaches us that there is no destiny. Our choices are always ours and we can always make the right ones. If even the likes of Darth Vader can be redeemed, then there's nothing stopping us from making amends and committing to doing what's right. From a certain point of view, Star Wars' final message is that we, too, can choose to be Jedi. We said at the start of this video that Star Wars is important. Importance is variable and may be a topic for debate, but what's undeniable is that Star Wars has made a difference for a whole lot of people. We hope you enjoyed this look at its deeper meanings and what resonates with us, and we're eager to hear what you think. What makes Star Wars important to you? 
feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below.